For those of you who are watching online, we welcome you. And I encourage all of you to get this book, Unexpected Fire. So much of what I will be sharing um, has details that you need to do your homework on, which means you need to read the book and look up the scriptures and find out that what I'm saying is not just my ideas, but things that are coming right out of the Bible. And a lot of teachings that I have discovered about the book of Revelation is that some teachers will take a little verse from here and then take it way out of context and make a whole doctrine about it. And uh, it should fit with the whole of scripture. It should fit with Matthew 24. It should fit with uh, Luke 17 and all the other scriptures like it's Zechariah and Isaiah and Ezekiel. So if you do a thorough study, you'll find you'll be wise and you'll be in step with the Lord. So please get a hold of this book and come with us now to the book of Revelation. We're going to be looking tonight at chapter 12. If I can move through it quick enough, we'll try to get into chapter 13, but that will take a minor miracle. But I want to go through the book of Revelation and give you a quick overview of what we have studied so far. This we have done five chapters, and this is Revelation study number six tonight, which means we have six, seven, eight, nine, ten, five studies more counting tonight. And how many of you are here and you haven't been to any of our studies on this, at this time on this subject uh, so far? This is your first time. Anyone? Well, it's good to see you here. Welcome. And we're ready for those of you who are watching for the first time Let's pray, and then I'm just going to jump into the deep end, just say one or two sentences and highlight some things in some chapters, and we're going to go chapter after chapter like that real quick in 10 minutes or so, and then we'll come to chapter 12, where we'll stick our heels in uh, and pull back the petals and let the flower uh, fragrance come forth. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all of your goodness. We thank you that you haven't left us in the dark, but you've given us so much information that we might be wise unto salvation and unto the purposes of your kingdom. And Lord, at this time, we welcome all that you would teach us. Lord, speak to us and prepare us and let us not have a heart of fear, but a heart of excitement for your glory to be accomplished. We pray it all in Jesus' name, amen. So if you have your Bible, flip through it as I flip through mine. So we're in rapture, uh, Revelation chapter one, and it, it tells us that this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Later on in the chapter, it tells us that John is introduced, that he is on the Isle of Patmos, and that he sees Jesus as he is now. Remember when he, saw, when he walked with him as one of his disciples, he was the sandaled rabbi of Galilee. But now he is the warrior king of heaven. His hair is white like snow, and his, his whole body is like fire. And when John sees him in this form, he falls to the ground like a dead man, like the blood drained out of him. Jesus puts his hand on him and says, do not be afraid. He says, I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, and I have the keys of hell and of death. And then he says to him in the last verse of this first chapter, he says, the stars that you see, the seven stars in my hand and the lampstand behind me, I'll tell you what they are. The lampstand are the seven churches and the stars are the angels. And then we go on to chapters two and three and we discover the seven letters to the churches of Asia. So John had to write out this book of Revelation seven times and give the, the study of the great tribulation to all of those churches and then give them a specific letter that was for that church. And in those letters, the Lord tells the church where they're doing great, where they have failed, how to improve, and how to be an overcomer. The same sins that are mentioned in these seven churches are the sins that we face right now as we come toward the great tribulation. There's no doubt a theme here and a design that the Lord would show us how to prepare as we come toward this. Please get the study and look at that list of sins and uh, judge yourself so that you won't be judged. That's what the Bible says. These seven churches had to receive the book of Revelation because God had to find keepers of the book. 
they had to be the ones who would honor John in such a way that they wouldn't change it. They wouldn't add to it. They wouldn't take away from it. And so it would be preserved until it became canonized and part of the scriptures and given to us in this present time and age. Now chapters 4 and 5 are a visit to the throne room. The Lord says to John, come up here. And John goes up and he sees an open door and he goes through the open door into the throne room of God. And there he sees the throne of God Almighty. But he doesn't see God himself. For the Bible says that this time no man can see God and live. But he sees lightning and fire and energy coming out of the throne. And he sees one part of God's hand. And that is his hand, of his, one part of his body. And that is his hand. And in his hand he has a scroll. And then John looks around and he sees the rest of the great throne room. He sees the four living creatures and a hundred million angels swirling overhead. And he sees the seven archangels around Jesus, which are called the seven spirits of God, the seven eyes of the Lord. And he sees Jesus, the Lamb of God, the Lion from the tribe of Judah, the Root of David. Those are his names. We have a Jewish God-man in the heavens who is the Messiah, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Yeshua Hamashiach. And he still retains his Jewish identity. And then we come and see in that same throne room 24 people, elders, who have crowns and bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. We see also an altar there, full of fire on it, which are the prayers of the saints. And, and as the seals get broken, once we get to the eighth seal, the fire is taken off of that altar which is in front of the throne with the prayers it's taken off by the altar of fire or the angel of fire the angel of the altar and he eventually throws it down to earth which means that the prayers that have been stored up in heaven finally get answered for the purposes of the end times so then we come on to chapter 6 and in chapter 6 we discover the beginning of the Great Tribulation. Now the Great Tribulation is going to last seven years. It will take three different dynamics or parts to it before it is finished. The first part takes place as Jesus pulls off the seven seals from, from the scroll that he takes from the hand of God Almighty. And when he pulls off the first four seals, four horses come forth. A white one, a red one, a black one, and a gray one. And they bring devastation to the world. These four apocalyptic horses begin the judgments. This is the series of the first judgments on the earth. And they bring war, the third world war, no doubt. And they bring famine all around the world because of maybe climate change. Whatever the reasons are, things cannot, now climate change is a very real thing. It may not be caused by man and it may be caused partly by man, but it is certainly very real. And the Bible talks about it. It says that the ozone layer will be depleted and all kinds of terrible things happen. Your skin will blister and the sun, well not yours but others, uh, skin will blister. And uh, so, so it's very real. It's very real. And so those are the four apocalyptic horses. And in that sixth chapter, we read there that um, a quarter of the people on the earth will die because of these four judgments that come. So if there's eight million billion people on the earth, there's more now, but if there's eight billion, that means that two billion people will die in the space of about two years. That means that one out of every four people on the earth in every country will die. Now we've seen some of this with this present COVID virus where people in every country die. And here in the United States we have the record for the most people who have died in the richest and most sophisticated country in the world. So do not think because we have modern medicine or modern shelters or modern military forces that that will stop us from being affected 
by the power of the great tribulation, but there is something that we will see that will protect us from the traumas of the great tribulation, and that's the protection of the Lord. Eight times in the book of Revelation, we read about the protection of the Lord. We read about the protection of the Lord on his people. It says things like, and so all those who had the mark of the beast were affected by this plague, which means that those who don't have the mark of the beast are not af affected by the plague. It says, do not bring this trauma until first we put a seal on the people of God so that they will not be hurt. So there is this amazing understanding that we have that we are not protected from persecution of the devil. In fact, many Christians will die because of the devil's persecution. But we are protected from the wrath of the Lord. For the wrath of the Lord is not for his children, but it is for those who refuse him and persist in their refusing him. So these first seven traumas are in chapter 6. And then in chapter 7, we see the first of the mighty revivals. In the first part of chapter 7, uh, chapter, in verse 4, we read about this Jewish revival. A symbolic 144,000 Jews from all these different tribes are there, and each of the tribes are mentioned. And except for Dan, but in its place, in Dan's place is Manassas. And so we see this Jewish revival. And then we see a revival of the nations, the Gentile revival. And it says in verse 9 of chapter 7 that people from every nation will come to the Lord and there be so many of them from every tongue and every nation and every tribe and every people group that their numbers will not be able to be counted. So this is the first but not the final great revival that takes place, these two revivals. I want you to notice that even at this point, there is an understanding that differentiates between Jews and Gentiles who walk with Jesus. Now there's only one name under heaven whereby a person can be saved and that's the name of Jesus. But it means that the eyes of the Jewish people will open and they will see Jesus as Messiah. And that will be an end time revival that will be coming to them. And then the nations of the world will come. Then we go to verse or chapter 8 and we see at the beginning uh, of the chapter the altar of fire which are the prayers of the saints just flaring up before the throne and the angel takes that fire and throws it down to earth and the answers the finally the answers to the ages uh, of people's prayers come about in the sixth verse of Romans chapter or Revelation chapter 8 we find the beginning of the next series of judgments and they are the blowing of the seven trumpets by the seven spirits of God, the seven angels of the Lord. And the first one blows, the second one blows, the third one blows, the fourth one blows, and all of these four judgments uh, that are coming when the trumpets are blown have to do with asteroids, meteors, and uh, an explosive asteroid that comes into the atmosphere. And they cause fires around the whole earth so that a third of the earth's vegetation is burned up and all the grass is burned up. And a third of all the waters are destroyed. And a third of all the creatures in the sea are destroyed because it's like a rock the size of a mountain hitting the Atlantic or Pacific Ocean. It destroys a third of the, of the boats and destroys a third of everything that's living because it's like a hundred nuclear bombs hitting the ocean all at once. And it also talks about the meteor shower, which is hail and brimstone, fire coming down from the tail of a comet, probably. And it comes into our atmosphere, and it lands as the world turns. It lands all around the world and burns all the grass and a third of the vegetation on the Earth. And then there's this other rock that comes into space and just as it comes into our atmosphere, it explodes and it releases heavy metals so that a third of all the water on the earth becomes poison. And it says many people die from that. But these are the first four judgments that come with the blowing of the trumpets. And then there's a warning that comes that says, 
Woe, woe, woe. Because of the last three trumpets that will be blown. See, the first four have to do with asteroids and meteorites. But the last three have to do with demons. And when those three are blown, first one, we find that demons like locusts come out of the abyss because an angel goes and unlocks it. And they come and they torment people who are not Christians for five months. And they give them pain like shingles, uh, like the sting of a scorpion. And people will want to die but not be able to die. So it says they have a king. And the king's name is Apollyon in the Greek and Abaddon in the Hebrew. And that beast, that king that comes up out of the abyss is the Antichrist. The Antichrist is not a person. It is a spirit that comes up out of the abyss. And several times when we read about the beast and the Antichrist who later gets the whole world worshiping him, it says, and the beast that came out of the abyss is like so and so. And he has seven horns and ten heads, which the Bible tells us are kings. Under his rulership, he has ten kings probably over the regions, the ten regions of the world. Like the king of Persia or Tyre. And he also has ten kings for each country that are over the seven mountains. They're the seven horns of power. And they're over the seven mountains in each of the countries. And those mountains include the political mountain, the educational mountain, the judicial mountain, uh, the police or, or military mountain, um, and the medical mountain, the religious mountain, and so on. And so we'll get into that later on in our study, but that is introduced to us uh, with this beast coming out of the abyss. Then in the 10th chapter, we read about our participation. There's a small scroll, and the Lord tells John, take it and eat it, and then prophesy to nations and kings. And so John is called not to be just a spectator, but to be an active participant. And I want to just say to you that there is a scroll written with your name on it and a call of God on your life, and that's in the 10th chapter. When we come to the 11th chapter, we read about Israel and the church. It starts off by saying, go and, and measure the, te the temple and count the number of worshipers who are there. And then it talks about these two witnesses. And as we discovered last week, the two witnesses of all the earth for all the ages are the church and Israel. Of course, in the last days, they come together as the one new man church. That is the birth of the man child in the book of Revelation. It is Israel and the church coming together. And we discover that um, by this time, so many people have died. And the Christians are alive. And they've been the ones to care and serve and minister and help. So when the elections come, and you get somebody who's a, a, a wizard or a witch, um, and somebody who's a born-again Christian who has helped and served and sacrificed by a landslide all around the world, people will vote in Christians and redeem Jews to be the rulers of their country. And the church will rise to its finest hour with supernatural power and authority. And that's what we find happen in chapter 11. But then it says in verse 7, this is chapter 11. Now when they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up from the abyss. So you see, the beast is the Antichrist. Where does he come from? The abyss. He doesn't come from Egypt. He doesn't come from Jerusalem. He doesn't come from the White House. He is not Russian. He comes from the abyss. He is a spirit. And he will attack them and overpower these Christians who are ruling the nations, the Jews and, and born-again Christians, and he will kill them. And it says their bodies will lie in the street for three days. And at the end of three days, in verse 11, it says that a breath of life from God will enter them 
and they stood on their feet and terror struck those who saw them. And then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying, come up here. And they went up into heaven. And then we come to verse 15 and we read about the seventh angel uh, about to blow his trumpet. Remember, there's only seven. Seven seals, seven angels, and then seven bowls of wrath. And the last blowing of the trumpet releases the last half of the great tribulation. And all that happens from this until Jesus comes is under what is known as the days of the seventh trumpet. All right. So now that you've got all of that and you understand it all and you're right with me in all these details, we come to chapter 12 and we have to slow down and look at it verse by verse. All right? Do you need a break? Good, good, good. <laughs> well, those of you who have been with us every week, this is no surprise what I've shared with you. And those of you who have been reading the book, you're right in step with me. So now here, we start to read in Revelation chapter 12. I'm just going to take a drink first. It says, A great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars on her head. Now this woman is the people of God. It's not Mary because you're going to find out that after the man child gets taken up to heaven that the devil comes after the woman. And you know that that doesn't apply to Mary. She's not the issue of eternity when it, even though the Catholic Church might think so, she's not the issue of eternity when it comes to God's end time purpose. But the issue of eternity has to do with people on the earth. It has to do with the woman who is clothed with the sun. The sun is God and the people of God have put on Christ. They have put on the covering and the cloak of the heavenly father. And she, it says, is clothed with the sun and with the moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars on her head. So here's this picture of all the people of God. This is actually a review, this chapter. We're looking at all of, of history and this woman, this bride of Christ, this wife of God, and she is standing on the moon because at one end, the moon represents the church because the church has no light of its own. It reflects the sun. The only light that the moon has is from the sun. And we, the church, have no light in ourselves, but we reflect the Son of God. And all through the scriptures, the moon represents the people of God. And she, this woman of God, has at one end of her the, her, the moon. And then it says she has a crown of 12 stars on her head. And what do you think that represents? Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel, right? So you've got this woman who is the people of God, the bride of Christ, the wife of God, clothed with God, and she is made up of the church, the moon, and the 12 stars in the crown, Israel. So this woman is pregnant. You see what it says in verse two? She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. So there's a lot of pain that is going to take place in the next few years. You've already experienced some. But the pain is labor pains. The church has to be transformed into an army for the people of God for the purposes of God, for the kingdom of God. The church has to become what God has called it to be. And that means Israel, redeemed Israel, who believes in Jesus after the revival comes, and the church of the nations will come together as the one new man church. Jesus said when he died on the cross, he broke down the middle wall of partition between Jew and Gentile, thus making one new man. And that picture is a picture of this woman now connected by the, by the Gentile church and redeemed Israel coming together as one. 
and she, this end time church. See, we've never seen this. We've never seen the Gentile church and redeemed Israel coming together at one. It's either been the church persecuting the Jews or the Jews persecuting the church. And even to this very day, there are still churches who are anti-Israel. Hard to believe. But we're in the middle of a phenomena, an amazing miracle of restoration and prophecy that says in the last days, Israel and the Gentile church will come together as one new church. Now there will be some labor pains. It says this woman who is clothed with the sun was pregnant. She's pregnant because she's about to bring forth the end time church, the church of power and authority. And she is in labor pains. Now I want you to hold your finger there and come with me to Matthew's gospel, chapter 24, which is about the last days. And it says, Matthew 24 and verse 7, this is concerning the last days. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. These are the beginning of birth pains. Did you see that? So here in Matthew's gospel, it is actually identical to the order of things that take place in the book of Revelation. And we see that these birth pains are there at the end of time in the book of Matthew. These are the beginnings of birth pains. So we'll go back now to Revelation chapter 12. It says in verse 3, then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his heads. And his tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and they flung them to earth. So the dragon, of course, is the devil. But when it talks about the devil, it's talking about all of his kingdom, the kingdom of darkness. And the beast has his position under the devil. He is like his number one general. And under the beast are 10 kings over the regions of the earth. And then seven other kings who are over each of the nations and their seven different high mountains of influence in society that are in every nation. And his job is to be an antichrist, to come against Christ and to destroy the people of God and everything that God wants to do. So when this end time church comes about, the one new man church, this is a halfway point of the great tribulation. That's why we're in the 12th chapter. It's all chronological. And at that time it says that the devil, it says, stood in front of the woman. This is halfway through verse 4. The dragon, the devil, stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child the moment it was born. So this is what is happening right now. Do you understand in America, there is a diabolical attack against the church. Some of it is straight on, and some of it is subtle. It's coming in through the back door. And it will get worse. In fact, by the time we are halfway through the Great Tribulation, it will be an all-out assault, so that when the end time church is birthed with power and authority like never before, it says the dragon, the devil, will be there at that moment to destroy and kill the church. Verse 5 says that this woman who is clothed with the sun, the people of God, give birth to a son, a male child who will rule the nations with a rod of iron. Now we saw that in the last chapter. 
where Jews and Gentiles rule the nations because they're voted in as mayors and governors and kings and presidents. And they rule the nation. And they stop abortion. And they stop homosexual parades in our streets. And they stop pornography on the internet. And they stop corruption in high places. They drain the swamp. And so this son, this church that is born, rules the nations with an iron scepter. But then the Lord lets them be killed. We just read that. And they're lying in the streets for three and a half days, and then what happens? A breath of life comes into them, and see what it says here? And her child was snatched up to God and to the throne. See, this is just a review of everything that we have studied so far in the book of Revelation. And then it tells us something about the people of God who are left behind. And don't believe in the other left behind series. It's, they didn't do their study properly. But here we discover that the woman fled into the desert in verse six to a place prepared for her by God where she will be taken care of for the last half of the great tribulation, which is three and a half years. It says here, 1,260 days. So there's a special protection that comes for God's people in the last half of the great tribulation because now the beast and the antichrist has become revealed. And he is on the march. He will kill a lot of Christians, but many will survive because the Lord will provide a place of safety for the people of God, the woman. And then we come up, this is all history, but then we come to verse 7, and we go on into the future, into the last half of the book of Revelation. And it says, there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, that's the devil, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough. And they lost their place in heaven. That great dragon was hurled down. That ancient serpent called the devil or Satan. Who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth. And his angels with him. So many people just cut this chapter out. And they put it. 10,000 years back and say Satan was cast out of heaven 10,000 years ago. Well, he wasn't completely cast out of heaven 10,000 years ago and this is not referring to anything that happened before the world was made. He did lose his place with God and he was cast out but he still goes back there. He still has, he has diplomatic immunity. Right now, he can go to heaven and he can come down here. And he can roam around the earth seeking whom he might devour. And you know in the book of Job, that's exactly what happened. You see the clearest picture of him going up and standing before the throne of God and accusing God of only forcing people to serve him. And God says, have you considered my servant Job? And the devil says, well, the only reason he serves you is because you give him all the candy. And he says, no, you can take away all the candy, only don't take his life. And so the devil goes on a rampage to destroy everything in Job's life because of the accuser of the brethren. And God is making a point to all of eternity and to all of the angelic beings and to us because it's given to us in the book of Job that even though somebody could lose everything, take the whole world, but give me Jesus and I'll be okay in the end. And that's the testimony of Job. And during all of these thousands of years, Satan has done that. He is called the accuser of the brethren. But at this time, in heaven, Michael gets permission. 
to go and beat him up. Because before this time, Michael can't do that. Because we read in the book of Jude, be careful that you're not too cute with principalities and powers. Because even the archangel Michael did not attack Satan, but said, the Lord rebuke you. So up until this time, Michael's being restrained. But he is chomping at the bit to go against this guy in the wrestling match, in the boxing match. And it says, and then at that time, at the halfway point of the great tribulation, there's war in heaven. And finally the Lord says, Michael, go and get him. And he goes and fights the devil and all of his angels in midair in heaven. And the devil loses. And he is hurled down to the earth. And his one third of all the angels of heaven with him. It hasn't happened yet. And what happens then is that he can't leave the planet. He is ticked off real bad at the halfway point of the great tribulation because he is cast out of heaven. He doesn't have diplomatic immunity anymore and he can't get off the planet. So we're going to read about it. Then in verse 10, I heard a loud voice in heaven say, now have come salvation, the power, and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers, who's that? The devil. Because the accuser of our brothers, who accuses them before our God day and night, has been hurled down. So this accusing is taking place right now. It's still taking place. But one day, it stops. Halfway through the great tribulation, it stops. And Satan gets fully and completely cast out of heaven and can't come back for a visit. And then the people of God, it talks about them in verse 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony and they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. They weren't afraid to die. So at the halfway point of the great tribulation, the devil is really getting slapped around. First, there's a battle in the heavens, and he and his angels fight against Michael, and their angels, and Michael and their angels beat them and throw them down to, to earth where they cannot escape. They have to stay on earth now. And then the people of God are taking shots at the devil too, and overcoming him by the blood of the lamb, not their own strength, but still the word of their testimony. This is what God did in my life this is who I know him to be now in the name of Jesus, you filthy demon. I rebuke you and send you on your way. I like it. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. And they did not lie. They, they weren't afraid to die. Therefore, rejoice you heavens and you who dwell in them. Why? Because finally, the devil won't be coming back for a visit. But woe to the earth and the sea because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury because he knows that his time is short. He knows he's only got three and a half years left. Verse 13, and when the dragon, the devil, saw that he had been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman. Who's the woman? Not Mary. It's the church and redeemed Israel. All right? The woman clothed with the sun. Now some of them, the, those who were in political power and authority, were killed and taken up to heaven. But those who perhaps weren't so strong, now the cream rises to the top. Some of you who are passive, who say, I don't want to be there, I don't like this, all of a sudden, an anointing will come upon you and lions will become, or lambs will become like lions. And you will see such an anointing. And the devil will come after the people of God. But remember I told you that, that the Lord will 
protect. He will take them away. That doesn't mean that you're going to go up into the forest somewhere and hide. But in some way, God will put a special protection and put you in a place of protection. It says in verse 13, when the dragon saw that he'd been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. That is the end time church coming out of the people of God. And the woman was given two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly to a place prepared for her in the desert where she would be taken care of for a time, that's a year, times, that's two years, and half a time, that's three and a half years. And out of the serpent's mouth, then from the mouth, the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and sweep her away in the torrent. I believe... I'll just tell you what I think this means. I think it means that such verbal propaganda will be given against the church at that time. Just like right now. You don't know what to believe when you listen to the news. And if you think that you're listening to the news and it's absolutely accurate, you are very gullible. Because we find it unfolding and that wasn't true, and that wasn't true, and that wasn't true. But the news is very consistent in not showing their faults. And they, they seem, there are certain news broadcasters that seem to twist every little bit of detail that comes. And this is aimed against people of God. Against the purposes of God. And so, it says... That the dragon opens its mouth and spews out a torrent. And then it says, but the earth helped the woman by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that the dragon had spewed out of its mouth. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to make war against the rest of her children. Those who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And the dragon stood on the shore of the sea. So halfway point, it's like Satan gets thrown down. It's the halfway point of the great tribulation. Three and a half years in. Three and a half years still to come. He gets thrown down to earth. He is just absolutely furious. And Christians are overcoming him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. And he makes war on the Christians. On the believers. But God puts a special protection against them. And even when he goes with demonic forces to influence demonic and evil people to spew out lies and all kind of like a river, like a torrent against the people of God. You know, that's been happening. You know, I remember when my dad was born in China. Um, you know, because they had communion, um, as, as Christians do, the Chinese people there who refused to come to the Lord they were telling everybody that Christians drink babies' blood to get the Chinese people against the Christians. So that kind of lie actually happens all over the place and isn't far from happening right here in America. But the Lord protects them. And it says, and the earth protects them, helps the woman by opening its mouth and swallowing the river. So, I'll tell you what will happen. Scientific proof will come forth. Logical proof that is undeniable that says abortion is wrong. And all of a sudden, the devil's going to find that just science itself will finally get to the place where it comes to what the Bible already teaches and says this is the truth. Scientific study that goes out into space, the deepest part of the sea, all over the land, with humanity and with animals, will prove the wisdom of God. And even though the devil comes against the church, he won't win the battle, because the earth will rise up and swallow uh, the attacks of the devil. And then, I have about 15 minutes. So I want to go into chapter 13. Are you with me? This is the introduction to the beast. 
I want you to notice that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it says now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is verse 1. You can put it up please. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 1. It says now concerning the coming of the Lord and our being gathered to him. So that is the second coming and the saints going to be with the Lord, right? It says in a couple of other verses, don't be deceived. This will not happen until first the Antichrist is revealed. So it, Jesus isn't coming at the beginning of the book of Revelation because the Antichrist doesn't get revealed until the 13th chapter. And it says, don't be deceived. Concerning the coming of the Lord and our being gathered to him, it won't happen until first the Antichrist comes. And then in verse 8 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it says, and the Lord will destroy this Antichrist with the splendor of his coming. And that's what we're going to find out, that when the Lord does come and gathers us unto himself, at the same time, he destroys the Antichrist. If he did that at the beginning in some pre-trib rapture, there would be no Antichrist for the book of Revelation. I'm just saying. Just, if we read the book, it is so clear. So here we go. I saw a beast coming out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads. And this is the same beast that comes out of the abyss. We read about that in chapter 17. And these ten heads and ten crowns are, or excuse me, ten crowns um, on the heads, which are ten heads and seven horns, um, they, excuse me, ten horns and seven heads. They are kings. And the beast I saw resembled a leopard. So the beast actually is, is given a description. He looks like a leopard. He has feet like a bear and a mouth like a lion. So he's a leopard with a huge mouth. And the dragon gave the beast, that is the Antichrist, his power and his throne and great authority. And one of the heads of the beast seemed to have a fatal wound. All right, remember the heads are these society leaders. They're kings. One of them falls. Which one is it? We already read about it. It was the political one. Because halfway through the Great Tribulation, all the countries are ruled by Christians and redeemed Jews. And they become the mayors and the governors and the kings. So one of these kings has a fatal wound. The whole world was astonished and followed, it says, the fatal wound that had been healed. And now God has removed that. So now demonic people are back in power. Just like every four years something changes here in America in terms of politics, it's going to happen just like that. And it says, the whole earth was astonished and followed the beast. Men worshipped Satan, the dragon, because he had given authority to the Antichrist, to the beast. And they worshipped the beast and said, who is like the beast? Who can make war against him? And the beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise his authority for 42 months. That's three and a half years. The beast exercises his authority for the last half of the seven-year Great Tribulation. Notice also that in verse 1 that we read, that he had ten horns and seven heads, and on each head was a blasphemous name. So each of these systems of the world Systems of America will be blasphemous. They will blaspheme God in schools, in political arenas, in hospitals, in every area. They all have blasphemy against God. And we read that again here in verse 5. The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise his authority for the last half of the great tribulation, 42 months. 
And he opened his mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. He was given power to make war against the saints and to conquer them so that he is able to persecute Christians. And he does. And he was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. All whose names have not been written in the book of life belonging to the lamb that was slain from the creation of the world. Whoever has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to go into captivity, into captivity he will go. If anyone is to be killed with the sword, with the sword he will be killed. This calls at this time, at the halfway point, this calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of the saints. This is a time when it gets rough. It gets really, really rough. And that's why the scripture says, and those who endure till the end, talks about that. And we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord. It talks about a certain people, a certain group that endure through it all. But this requires endurance and faithfulness on the part of the saints. We're doing well, time-wise. Verse 11. Then I saw another beast. This is the false prophet. All right? Coming out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb. So we see a description of him as well. But he, smo he spoke like the devil. He spoke like a dragon. And he exercised all the authority of the first beast. So he takes the authority of the Antichrist on his behalf and made the earth and its inhabitants worship the Antichrist, the first beast, whose fatal wound had been healed. Because now they have political power again. And he formed great and miraculous signs. This is the false prophet, the second beast. Even causing fire to come down from heaven to earth in full view of men. Because of the signs he was given power to do, he was given power to do on behalf of the first beast, he deceived the inhabitants of the earth. Joy and I were just watching TV just last night. And the commercials were either absolute perversion or absolute witchcraft and demons. And they were advertising new series that were coming and new movies that were coming. And it looked like every one of them was all about demonic spirits or witchcraft or great sexual perversions. And so this, the world, and it's very strategic right now, even with Harry Potter, they're getting people focused on the supernatural and saying it's normal to have good witches. It's normal to have bad witches and good witches. Just be good witch. So it says he deceived the inhabitants of the earth. And he ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And he was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so that he could speak and cause all who refused to worship his image to be killed. And this is where it comes to the place of the mark of the beast. So don't think that the mark of the beast is here. We can't have the mark of the beast until we're halfway through the great tribulation. So every time some new computer or device comes out, crazy Christians say, that's the mark of the beast. Well, it's not the mark of the beast. Because that hasn't, we're not there yet. It'll be far more technical and far more advanced than what we can imagine. And we are not there. But whoever doesn't worship, and this is why the church at this point has to go undercover. And I know a lot of Christians who say, so I am going to store up food. I'm going to buy a, a property out in the forest with a big barbed wire fence around it. And I'm going to have a tower and a machine gun and hand grenades. And I'm going to stock up food to last me for five years. Now, it may last you for five months. But it won't last you for five years. 
Because if you're Christians, you're going to be giving it to everybody who's another Christian and who wants help. Or else you need to question your Christianity. And so people who don't have it are going to become knocking on your door. And you will think, well, I can take care of 20, but then 2,000 come. And you'll find it gets drained pretty quick. And all of your human efforts, I'm not saying you shouldn't have some things stored away, but all of your human efforts will fail you. But the power of the Holy Spirit and the guidance of God and the protection of the Lord will not fail you. So we read on. We're doing well. So he also, in verse 16, was forced, forced everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on his right hand and on his forehead so that no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of his name. This calls for wisdom. First of all, it says this calls for patience and endurance and faithfulness on the part of the saints. Now it says this calls for wisdom. So I think it's a little understanding that God thinks we need these things because he's telling us you need patience, you need endurance, and you need faithfulness, and now you need wisdom. It calls for wisdom. If anyone has insight, let him calculate the number of the beast for his man's number. The number is 666. So man's number is, is six. Grace is five. Perfection is seven. Resurrection or rebirth is eight. So we can go through the numbers of, in the Bible and understand numerology and the number six is about man. The day he's created. And the spirit of Antichrist his image is the number of man. And the number of man, if you want to give it a word, is humanism. Humanism is man's religion without God. It says that God is on the throne. Education will make us like God. Just educate us more. The priests of that humanism are the professors in liberal universities. And communism says we don't need God. All the isms of the world said we don't need the God of the Bible. There's only one God and then there's all the other religions. And this number of man is humanism. Putting man on the throne. If you want to do it, it's okay. There's no absolute rules. You don't have to believe in a God who's putting rules on you. If it feels good, you can do it. That's humanism. So, our time's up. But chapter 14 is about revival. The greatest revival in all of history. We're going to study it in the next chapter. Because now we've seen a review in chapter 12 and we've seen the devil cast down. By the way, that's the third woe of the three woes. The first one with these demons and the beast coming out of the pit. The second one with these four demons coming out of the river Euphrates who bring the world into a bloodbath. And this third blowing of the last trumpet, this third woe, is Satan coming down upon the earth full of fury. And now we find in verse, in chapter 13, that the beast now is revealed. This antichrist that comes out of the, out of the abyss, he becomes revealed. The whole world is forced to worship him. And in the next chapter, because now we've seen what's happening in the devil's camp. The next chapter is going to show us what's happening in God's camp with the people of God. At this time, when all of this nastiness is coming forth, you're going to see the most powerful anointing 
on intercessors and the people of God like you've never seen in all of our history since the days of Adam. We've never seen anything like this. And that's chapter 14, the great harvest of the earth and the people of God who are so amazing. Well, it's time to pray. I know I've given you a lot. I encourage you to get the book, Unexpected Fire, and to read it, and uh, read chapter 14 and 15 for next week. Read chapter 14, 15, and 16. I'll try to get through as many as I can. All right, stand to your feet, please. Let's pray. Hold your hands up. Those of you watching online, please pray with us. Say, Heavenly Father, thank you for all of the information all of the details that you show us in the book of Revelation. Lord, there's been no soldiers who have been better equipped than the people of God who understand the book of Revelation. Help us, Lord. We understand that right now we are frail and we feel insignificant and many people don't want to be there when all of this happens. But we also understand that a new anointing is coming and that you will prepare us and equip us and fortify us and empower us to overcome the devil and to be the people of God to release the kingdom of God in the world's darkest hour. The church will be in its finest hour. We receive your blessing In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Please put your hand on your heart now. Let me pray for you. Those of you who are online, I ask you to stop what you're doing and put your hand on your heart now. In the name of Jesus, I speak the blessing of the Lord over you. I release the shadow of the Almighty to come upon you to even in these days, before the great tribulation begins, that you will know his covering and his care, his love and his compassion, and that you will have exceptional revelation and authority and wisdom in the purposes of God, that you might win many souls to Christ and see many healings And encourage many with the word of God. I speak the blessings of the Lord over each of you. The fulfillment of your ministries. The healing of your bodies. The healing of your broken heart. And I speak peace in your home. And the joy of the Lord in your heart. And I release blessings on your marriage. And on your children. And your grandchildren. And your great grandchildren. I speak the favor of God over you and I open the doors for your future that you might be in step with the creator and with the king of kings. I speak it over you now in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Good night and God bless you.